time. Give praise to the Lord. Amen. All right. Now, this is a time where we used to shake hands, say hello to each other. Unfortunately, we cannot do that. But please, just turn around and look at somebody and smile with your eyes. You may be seated. Welcome to Cabo Church. What about a big applause for the praise and worship team? They did a very good job today. First of all, I would like to recognize our first time guest. If you are here for the first time, please just raise your hand and tell us where are you from? Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington. Welcome. Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. De Cabo, from Cabo. Mega plus, eh? Welcome also to all the people that are watching us online. Welcome to Cabo Church. I'm sure that God has a special message for you today. Right now, it is time to receive our tithe and offering. We thank you very much for supporting Cabo Church Ministry. We are here with a lot of kitchen, trying to bring love, trying to show what teach what Jesus came to teach us. We thank you very much for your generosity, Cabo Church. Right now, please help me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, Father. Oh, Lord, I don't know why you choose me to be here today. I'm not perfect, not even close to be. I recognize to you, Lord, that I am a sinner. I want you, please, Lord, to wash me with your blood I know that there is a lot of people here that are here because they want to change their behavior because they want to be more like you open our hearts today Lord please speak to us and receive this offering that they give you Lord what can we give to you everything is yours Father please be with us today we need your Holy Spirit to come today so can comfort the ones that are sad, the ones that feel lost, the ones that feel that everything is over. You give them a second opportunity, Lord. Please bring them a second chance right now. And a fresh spirit within them, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And right now the ushers are going to pass. Today is a special day. Pastor Michael is not here with us today, but we have a guest speaker. Uh, I know him. He's part of Cow Church. Uh, and what I can tell you is that every time that I am around him, I feel the spirit of Lord because he makes me feel comfortable. I know he's a great person. He likes to help. He's amazing. And I think there's nobody more perfect to bring a message today than Jason Stirrup. Please, everybody, a big applause for our dear brother. So we didn't do a mic check, so we'll start there. Sound booth, does it sound all right? Okay. I don't know if that was a thumbs up or another finger, but we're going to run with it. Uh, we're going to start with prayer. Father, just thank you so much for being the most important attendee of Cabo Church and our honored guest, Father, each service. Father, I pray that your spirit would be pleased with what happens today and that we would be pricked to our hearts and challenge, Lord. 
pray a blessing over each and every one of the individuals that are here and listening. You are doing mighty things here in Cabo San Lucas and all over the globe. In Jesus' name, amen. No, it's so much more fun to be on the other side of the pupil, the pulpit, I should say. And, uh, but we're going to just jump into this. There's a lot of material to cover. The clock is showing 9.28. And I know this is going to be a big blessing to all of you. The title of this message is The Sins of the Kings of Judah. So in preparation for this message, I was overwhelmed with a burden to feed you this word and for you to take it in and be nourished by it. And there's just so much to this section of the Bible as there is with every section of the Bible. And my hope is that in listening to this teaching, you'll both be encouraged and challenged to honor God in a higher way in higher ways than you have become accustomed to. And when pastor asked me to share, you know, I get excited because I'm forced into a situation where I have to listen and dig deeper. And if you've ever been in a position of teaching, you'll know that the one who benefits the most is the one that's preparing the class. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to share with you once again. Let's dig into this teaching that is a two-part teaching, part one entitled, The Kings. The first king of Israel was Saul, and he reigned for 40 years. He was followed by his son, King David. Uh, He was followed by, uh, not by his son, he was followed by King David, who also reigned for 40 years. And David so loved the Lord that it was his burning desire to build God a temple, in, in, in God's city of Jerusalem. And his desire was to bring God's presence to be close to him and to be close to the people. But God forbid it because David had been a man of war and there was blood on his hands. But God promised to David that he would have a son whose name would be Solomon and it would be Solomon that would build the temple and fulfill David's dream. And near the end of David's life, he began making preparations for the construction of the temple. Just picture this. A father at the end of his life, he has this dream that he knows he can't fulfill, and he starts to make preparation to set up his son for success. I think all of us as fathers can identify with David's position So he began assembling dressed stone, iron, cedar logs, gold, silver, and bronze. And when David's son Solomon was still young and and inexperienced, David sat down with him to charge him with this task. And when David laid to rest, Solomon became king and reigned over Israel for 40 years. A reign of peace and prosperity, for the Lord gave Solomon great which great riches, and great wisdom. And under Solomon's reign, Israel completed the construction of this magnificent temple modeled exactly after the throne throne room of heaven. Following its completion, there was elaborate dedication to the temple of the living God, perhaps the most abundant dedication of any kind of all time. And in 1 Kings 9, we read that the Lord appeared to Solomon. This was not the only time that God had visited with the king, but let's read this particular interaction. 1 Kings 9, 3 to 9. Please follow me if you have your Bible with you or look onto the screens. We've got it there. Thank you very much. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plead you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. 
As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and upright, uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe, do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But if you, if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, worship them then I will cut off Israel from the land I, had given, I have given them and reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass will be appalled and, and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing in this, in, to this land and to this temple? And people will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord their God who brought their ancestors out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. Whew, strong. As we continue, we learn that despite Solomon's great wisdom and prosperity, he was led astray by his many foreign women. I know the feeling. I'm actually married to one myself. But Solomon had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. I was thinking about this last night. Can you imagine? That's about two uh, wedding anniversaries per day and about three birthdays every day. Uh, he had his hands full. I got my hands full with my one foreign wife. In 1 Kings 11, 4 to 8, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. And the Lord became angry with Solomon. And after 120 years of the United Kingdom of Israel, mo most of that time anyways, 40 years under King Saul, 40 years under King David, and 40 years under King Solomon, the kingdom was divided. Of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin were united to form the kingdom of Judah. And its capital was in Jerusalem, God's city. While the 10 northern tribes continued to use the term kingdom of Israel. And I believe the capital was in Samaria. So we have two kingdoms that are divided. The ten northern tribes are slightly north, and then Benjamin and Judah under the kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as the capital. And the kings of Israel, so I'm referring to the ten northern tribes, did great wickedness in the eyes of the Lord. And eventually, they were brought into the captivity of the Assyrians. Now, if you don't know much about the Assyrians, um, they, were, they are famous for being really, really good at war. Much in part due to their iron weapons, which were much stronger than the copper weapons being used by the surrounding nations. And actually, the Assyrians are still around today. Uh, they, ha they no longer have a country of their own, but there are an estimated between two and five million Assyrian descendants worldwide 
with about half a million living in the United States of America. Ironically enough, the largest con concentration of the Assyrians in the United States is in the city of Detroit. I guess that may be God's way of paying back, <laughs> paying back the Assyrians for their destruction of the ten northern tribes. Apart from Stevie Wonder, I'm not a big fan of Detroit. Uh, but interesting twist here, the prevailing religion of the Assyrians is Christianity. And I believe one day they will have a nation of their own once again. So while the people of the kingdom of Israel were relocated to Assyria, they became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. The people of the kingdom of Judah remained with Jerusalem being the capital. And the first king of Judah, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, he was not a great guy. He stirred up the jealous anger of the Lord. The people of Judah set up for themselves what the scriptures refer to as high places, which were used as places of worship to foreign gods, or what I call non-gods. Non there were even male shrine prostitutes in the land and people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven, driven out before the Israelites when they came out of the desert. And several kings followed King Rehoboam. And I'm going to share with you very briefly some things that are recorded about them. King Abijah committed all the sins of his father. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. King Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his fathers had made. He cut down the Asheria pole and had it burned. However, he did not remove the high places. He was followed by his son, King Jehoshaphat, who walked in the ways of his father Asa. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. And the people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Jehoshaphat was succeeded by his son, Jehoram, who did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then by Ahaziah, who acted similarly. King Joash followed and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. King Amaziah followed the steps of Joash, as did King Azariah. They did what was right, but the scriptures clearly indicate that the high places were not removed. King Ahaz turned away from the Lord altogether and followed the sins of of the kings of Israel, even sacrificing his son by passing him through the fire. So as I was going through these chapters of First and Second Kings, this is a few months back, in my nighttime Bible reading uh, favorite part of the day, I felt a mixture of two very, very strong emotions great sorrow and great anger. This is supposed to be the remnant of God's holy nation, His chosen people. And the heartbreak of God, as I was going through these pages, is really almost unbearable. And I found my spirit crying out, Lord, is there not even one of the kings of Judah who will walk in your ways? And then I found myself introspective. The high places hidden places out of sight, the overlooked places, secret sin, overlooked sin, little sins. 
And in my anger, the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, Son, are you so different from the kings of Judah? And there was no other response available. Lord, I humble myself in your presence. Reveal to me the high places in my life and help me to tear them down. You see, it, it's, it's recorded in the books of Kings that most of the kings of Judah did what was right in God's eyes. But the high places were not removed. He's an all-in God. All in God. Thank you very much. I should probably buy stock in Kleenex. <laughs> Second Kings eighteen. God is so wonderful. He showed me this right after that interaction with me. Second Kings eighteen three to eight. King Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah, Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. That was not the purpose of the bronze snake. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands of the Lord that the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the mighty king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. Part two, getting out of sin. In 1 Corinthians 15, 56, read, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You'll notice here that the Apostle Paul didn't write that the strength of sin is the flesh, nor did he write that the strength of sin is the devil. No, rather, it's, it's, it's really quite clear he explains that the strength of sin is the law. And when we read the term the law, it is referring to the, to the law that, got, that God gave the Israelites through his servant Moses. The Mosaic law, the moral law, and in particular the Ten Commandments. Without the law, there is no sin. Not only was the law written on those stone tablets that Moses brought down, but it's also written on our hearts. And this is the conscience bearing witness. This is a scripture from Romans 2.15. The conscience bearing witness. It's the conscience that tells us what is right and what is wrong. And there may be somebody here that thinks, well, Jason, if the law is written on my heart, then how come I don't feel that I'm doing anything wrong? And the Bible is very clear about that. It's because your conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. For those that like to barbecue in the summer months, imagine that big, thick, juicy steak being seared on the grill. That's the image that Paul gives to his disciple Timothy, his adopted son, the conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. 
your conscience has become accustomed to sin and no longer screams out in defiance. Hebrews 9.27 reads, It is appointed unto men to die once and then the judgment. What will we be judged by? We will be judged according to the law. And each one will be weighed on the scales of God's utmost justice. And we will each be found wanting or be found lacking. Each man has his own standard of goodness, but all fall short of God's thorough and perfect goodness. The prophet Malachi wrote, Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? And John, after he was taken up to heaven, in this amazing vision, wrote, for the, day, for the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? I've yet to meet the man who will stand in the presence of God in his own personal righteousness. And the closer I walk with the Lord, the more I realize how very far away I am from His standard. In Romans 3.19 we read, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That is the true purpose of God's law. It's a mirror that reveals to, our, reveals to us our true state. We will all be found guilty before the living God. In Romans 2.5-6, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. And His, His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Ladies and gentlemen, these are all, almost all Scriptures from the New Testament. I want to make that very clear. His wrath is stored up for each of us. God must punish sin. Only a corrupt judge would allow a lawbreaker to get away without a consequence. So how can anyone escape the eternal consequences of sinning in the eyes of an all-holy God? This is the fun part of this message, enter the good news of the gospel. In God's utmost justice was found His utmost love. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sends His Son to receive the punishment of my crimes for your crimes, for the violations of his law. The perfect, the clean, the just takes the consequences of the sins of mankind for the unperfect, the unclean, the imperfect, the unclean, and the unjust. We must see our reflection in the mirror of God's law, recognize our current state, and throw ourselves at the feet of of a holy judge. Lord, I see now my present state. I have no defense. Have mercy on me, a hopeless sinner. Mercy. God does not give us what we deserve. Grace. God does give to us what we don't deserve. And that is eternity with Him. We are saved by grace and grace alone. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Is Leslie still with us? Leslie, let's uh, help me to See if I'm not the only one crying at the end of this. 
Today is the day of salvation. Humble yourselves, repent, and trust in God's atonement. That is Christ Jesus to save you. He, promised, he promises to you a new heart, one that longs for new desires. The law of the Lord becomes a delight in your life, and you desire, your desire is to please Him. For those that are in the faith like me, and many who are listening, there's an ongoing battle between this new heart that God has given us and the old flesh. It's the old flesh that will keep those high places active in your life. And God so beautifully reveals these areas of your life as you are walking with Him. And He calls you to put your house in order so that you may be a holy vessel and enjoy a richer level of intimacy with Him. John 17, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life starts now. When this old body dies, that eternal life of knowing and being in communion with God through His Holy Spirit, that will continue. And God's desire for your life is that you walk in close intimacy and fellowship with Him. And this is not just for special people. This is a call. This is a call to each of us in some of the lowest, most forgotten outcasts of the world will walk in the closest fellowship with Him. And I want to be one of them. Now I've shared with you where strength gets its sin. I think it would be good that I share with you the strength of obedience. John 14. This is directly from the lips of our Lord Jesus. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you a, another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, this is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and manifest myself to them. That, that, that word manifest myself to them means coming out of the spiritual realm and into the physical realm. Fall in love with God. This love is the strength of obedience. Please stand to your feet with me. If indeed you have been pricked to your heart, humble yourselves before the living God who knows your down-sitting and your uprising and every thought from afar. Let's take a moment to turn within and acknowledge that we have fallen short of God's will. Today is the day of salvation. In God's extravagant love, He made a way. Repent and place your trust in Jesus. The sacrifice of the Son is more than a sufficient atonement. We come into this world empty-handed. Let's leave with our hands held by the Savior. If you would like prayer, please come forward. If you need to leave, please don't do so quietly. And thank you 
very much.